Well, it is great to see you, Purpose Church. I'm so glad we're together online today. Uh, today, we're continuing our summer series, Unqualified Yet Chosen, a study in the life of David. And today, our study from his life is a man after God's own heart. You know, David is just such a great example uh, of what our goal should be in following Jesus, who is called the son of David. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And David is one of those examples given to us in scripture uh, as to the greatest pursuit we can have, which is to be a woman after God's own heart or a man after God's own heart. In Acts 13, verse 36, it says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, that is, he died. And that's true for you and for me. God gives you a purpose, and you are here not by accident. You live in this generation, at this time, this place. You don't live where you live by accident. You don't go to school where you go to school by accident. You don't work where you work uh, by accident. Who knows that you've come to this particular moment in history for such a time as this. And so just like David, uh, God has raised you up and given you a purpose uh, for this generation, and we serve that purpose, and then we go to sleep, and we wake up in heaven for all eternity. In Psalm 78, verse 70, it says, he chose David as servant, and he chooses you to be his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. Now, think about that for a moment. Uh, sometimes the sheep pens are clean, but sometimes they're filled with sheep manure, and sometimes uh, our growing up and the past experiences we've had, sometimes they're nice and clean, like a clean sheep pen. But sometimes they're messy. And yet God doesn't waste anything in your life. You know, if there's anything I've learned as I've gotten older, is that God doesn't waste things in your life. He, he uses the clean sheep pen times. He uses the messy sheep pen times. If you're a student and you're in a class right now and you just say, you know, what does this have to do with my future goals? You'll be amazed how every class you take at school, God will use it in some way. He uses every experience, the good ones as, as well as the hard ones. And so just like David, he chooses you to be his servant. He takes you uh, from your background, from the, from the sheep pens, uh, from tending the sheep. Okay, you say, uh, you know, I'm tending the sheep. David's sitting there just taking care of a messy sheep. Nobody sees what, what's going on in his life. Nobody applauds him. Nobody notices him. And yet th the same thing is true for you. You're just kind of going through the ordinariness of, of life. And then God says, you know what? I'm calling you from tending the sheep. And, and, and as you tend the sheep, I have a higher purpose for your life. He brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them. So, so God gives you this assignment. Uh, your oikos, the Greek word for household, the eight to 15 in your sphere of influence. If you're a teacher, he gives you that classroom. If you're a nurse, he gives you that floor of the hospital or of the, of the medical facility where you're at. If you're a, a, a fireman, he gives you that district. If you're a police officer, he gives you that precinct. Um, if you're a business person, he, he gives you uh, that particular uh, sales assignment. He, he gives us a, that, that opportunity, places us there, and then we're called to fulfill that, to shepherd the people around us, to influence the people around us, to do it, first of all, with integrity of heart. Uh, that is to, to develop our character and our integrity, to live righteously before God, and then with skillful hands. So he says, hone your skills that God has given you, have integrity at heart, and then shepherd the people in the place, in the generation in which God has placed you. And then God uses you for eternal purposes. Never look down on wherever God has you right now. It's it's matters for eternity. You're gonna get to heaven and realize, I, I think that you should have taken yourself more uh, importantly, you should have taken yourself more seriously uh, because everything you do has eternal ripple effects. Effects. Now, here are a few of David's accomplishments. 
Uh, he expanded Israel's boundaries from 6,000 to 60,000 square miles, just like Thomas Jefferson did in our history. Uh, he established extensive trade routes to the entire known world, just like George Washington did in our nation. Uh, he unified the nation, uh, joining the northern and southern territories, just like Abraham Lincoln. He subdued the enemies of Israel more completely than ever had been done since the people had entered the land under Joshua, just like Franklin Roosevelt. He shaped a national interest in spiritual concerns, uh, just like Billy Graham. Um, David is still so highly regarded in Israel that in the 1990s, uh, Foreign Minister Shimon Peres publicly criticized David, and people were so incensed that it almost led to the collapse of the Israeli government at that time. 3,000 years after his death, people were still defending his honor and his reputation. But as great as David was, all of this is nothing compared to God using you to change one person's eternal destination. Shepherding that class of third graders here at Purpose Church, shepherding your family, your children, your grandchildren, uh, shepherding, influencing the people around you at work or at school, all of these accomplishments of David, nothing compared to God using you to change one person's eternal destination. And God uses you when you're a, a man or a woman after God's own heart. So we're going to look at five character traits of King David and compare them to King Saul, who was not a man after God's own heart. So we're going to compare uh, David and Saul. Number one, David had a sensitivity to sin. As individuals and as a culture, we are losing our sensitivity to sin. If you look around in our society, in our nation, in our culture, if you look at our own hearts, we're just getting dull uh, to sin. We're losing our sensitivity to it. I love this quote. Kimberly sent it to me the other day uh, by Denzel Washington. With so many things coming back in style, I can't wait until morals, respect, and intelligence become a trend once again. That a great quote. Uh, we Now, we think that the closer we get to God, the less there is to fix in our lives. But actually, the opposite is true. The closer you get to God, the more sensitive you are uh, to sin. Uh, at the beginning, as you walk with God, you're working on things like wrong words or wrong actions. But the closer you get, now you're working on things in addition to those like wrong thoughts or wrong attitudes or wrong motivations. Uh, imagine the power gets knocked out in your heart and your house. So you walk up, wake up without electricity, let's say 5.30 in the morning, and it's still dark when, when you get up. And you look in the mirror and you're like, okay, I look pretty good. Uh, so then you go down, you stumble around, you find your way to eating breakfast, and then you look in the mirror around six o'clock and there's a little bit more light. The sun's come up a bit, and you look in the mirror, and you just go, okay, generally, it still looks good. But then you get completely ready, and you look in the mirror at 6.30 in the morning, and now the sun's fully up. The light is streaming uh, through the windows, or maybe your electricity at that time comes back on again. The lights are fully on, and now you look at yourself in the mirror, and you're like, oh my goodness, I've got some work to do before I go out. More light leads to more things, seeing more things that need to get fixed. And the closer we get to God, the more we realize and, and the light kind of shines into every uh, place in our lives, the recesses of our, of our thinking and our motivations and our heart. And, and the closer we get, the more sensitive we are to sin. And that's what we see in David's life. Uh, in Psalm 51, he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Uh, last month, we uh, saw the story 
uh, Pastor Eric was preaching on uh, in Psalm, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 5. And uh, it says, afterward, David, uh, he had cut the corner of, of Saul's robe off, which was a dishonoring to uh, the royalty. To cut off the robe meant that David was trying to take his kingdom from him. And afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. We see that word with David multiple times, conscience-stricken. He was, was sensitive uh, uh, to sin. Next month, uh, I'm going to be preaching um, on 2 Samuel chapter 24. And again, it says David was conscience-stricken after he counted the fighting men. And we're going to look at that next month and, and see why that was wrong. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Now, it wasn't that David was sinless. We, we know that's uh, not true. He, he, he struggled with a lot of stuff, far from it. But it was how he responded to sin when God revealed his sin to him. It wasn't that he was sinless. It wasn't that he was perfect. It's how he responded when the light of God's conviction uh, came into his heart. It's how he responded. Now, you compare his attitude to Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15, he says, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. And you can read the context of these stories later on. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers, okay, he blames other people. He said, look, I, 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 I really was trying to do the right thing, but the, the soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God in order to, he tries to put a spiritual spin on it here, to sacrifice them uh, to the Lord your God at, at Gilgal. Um, now, like I said, you can read the context of these stories, but basically what Paul, Saul is doing here is he's twisting the truth to, to make it seem that what he did was in obedience to God when in actuality it was in disobedience. It's kind of like he shoots an arrow wherever he feels like it, and then he runs and tries to paint a target around where the arrow uh, uh, fell. So he twisted the truth. Then in verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, uh, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Now, if he had just stopped right there, period. If he had just stopped, that would have been good. But then he goes on to try to blame other people or circumstances. I was afraid of the men. Now, wait a minute. He's the king. These men are under his command, but he blames them for doing wrong. I was afraid of the men, and I gave in uh, to them. So he blamed others, or he blamed his circumstances uh, for doing wrong. Uh, to blame, Rick Warren says, to blame is to be lame. Uh, to blame is to be lame. And we have a blaming culture that's always blaming other things rather than taking responsibility for our wrongdoing. We blame others for our sins or, or we blame God. Uh, you know all the stories, you've heard them down through the years. A robber climbs on the roof of a store in order to, to break into the store and to rob it. And he falls through the skylight and, and gets injured. And then he sues the store for his injuries. Or have you heard the story of the guy that jumped in front of a subway train and he ends up suing the subway for his injuries? But maybe the king of all of them is a guy named Randy Buck, age 23 of Siloam Springs, Arkansas. This is from the Northwest Arkansas Times. Uh, he ran away from officers after he was sentenced to 90 days in jail. Officer Dick Wales was escorting Buck from court to jail when he, quote, just bolted out the door. Buck escaped from the Siloam Springs Jail in 1992, for which he is now suing the county for, quote, violating my civil rights by allowing me to escape. So uh, we, we know that there's this thing within our culture of just always trying to blame others, or sometimes we blame God. Uh, Proverbs 19, verse th three, uh, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness. And then they're angry at the Lord. And then in verse 30, Saul replied, I have sinned, uh, but, but please honor me 
before the elders of my people. I, I, I sin, but I still want to look good in front of other people. So, so Samuel, would you please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel? Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Uh, he puts up a front. So sometimes uh, Saul, rather than owning up to his sin, sometimes he twists the truth to make it look like he was obedient when he wasn't. Uh, sometimes he blames others or his circumstances. And, and sometimes he puts on a front to look like he's being obedient when he actually isn't. So David, the man after God's own heart, uh, sensitive to sin, a uh, Paul, a uh, Saul, uh, always looking for excuses to avoid responsibility and truly repenting. Then number two, David insisted on doing things God's way and in God's time. It says in 1 Samuel 24, verse 3, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. This ought to be an Awana Bible verse. I, I think, at least for the junior hires, I think they would love to memorize that verse. Uh, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Okay, So then in verse 4, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Now, let's just hold it there for a second. Uh, Pastor Eric preached on this a few weeks ago, and, and I have to admit, he pointed out something I'd never seen before. I, I have to admit, just not thinking about it deeply, I always thought they were like quoting some word from the Lord. But Pastor Eric, he pointed out, they were just making up scripture here. They were just making up stuff. There's no place where God had said this to David. He never said it to him. So they're just making up scripture on the spot. And, and we do the same thing. If it feels good, do it. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Um, uh, live your own truth. Follow your heart. You be you. Love is love. Uh, love is like a bird. Let it go if it comes back to you. If it doesn't, it never was. Uh, you got to know when to hold up, know when to fold up, know when to walk away, know when to run. I mean, we just, we just like make up uh, stuff and, and, and then just say it's Scripture. And that's what they're doing right here. They're just like making up Scripture on the spot. But David says you got to do God's things God's way and in God's timetable. Uh, he says in chapter 26, verse 9, David says to Abishai, don't destroy him. That is, don't kill Saul. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. He said, I'm, I'm going to submit myself to doing things God's way and waiting patiently for God's timetable. Oh, that's hard to do. That's so hard to do. It's so hard to wait for God's timing. You want to take a shortcut and get there faster or to, or to do it God's way. You want to take a shortcut. And that's what Saul uh, gave into. Let's compare David to Saul's attitude. Um, Samuel had said to him, wait for me to sacrifice before you go to war against the enemy, against the Philistines. He said, whatever happens, what, no matter what pressure you feel, no matter what temptation you might have, wait for me. And Saul, and you can just feel his angst here. He waited for seven days. The Philistine army's there, and here's his army, and he's vastly outnumbered. And, and he waits seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. He's already outnumbered, and he sees the men just begin to go home. And he, and he feels this pressure, and Samuel told him to wait for God's timing, but it's so hard sometimes to, to wait. Uh, so he said, he gives into it, bring me the bird off and the fellowship offerings. He, Saul wasn't supposed to offer that. Samuel was supposed to do it. But he says, bring it to me. 
as Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now, he try, see how he tries to put a spiritual spin on it here? This is this is Saul, always kind of like twisting it a bit. And he tries to make it sound like his motivation was right. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. He puts a spiritual spin on it. So I felt compelled to offer the, the burnt offering. And, and so he doesn't do things God's way. He doesn't wait for God's timing on it. You know, that's the basic issue in life is this. Do I wait? Do I discipline myself to do things God's way? Or do I take a shortcut? Do I wait for God's timing? Or do I take a shortcut? You know, years ago, when our children were small, the older four were younger, and we took a cross-country trip, and each of the children was allowed to say, this is my favorite thing that I want to do. So we were driving towards St. Louis. Our son, John, wanted to go to a St. Louis Cardinals baseball game uh, because that was our favorite team. And on the way there, we were going to stop at Leah's favorite, which was the Precious Moments Chapel in Carthage, Missouri. She wanted to go to where the Precious precious Moments figurines were made. And and so we're, we're going there, and I look at the map, and I'm like, you know what? If we take a shortcut across Kansas to get to Missouri, we can pick up another state. And and I was famous for wanting to see how many states we could pick up. And so, you know, sometimes we would drive just far enough to cross the Iowa border and get out of the car and stand there and say, hey, we're in Iowa, get back in the car, drive away. And so I wanted to do that, cut off a corner of Kansas. And so we cut across Kansas, we get out of the car, we're in Kansas. And then we start driving on these backcountry roads, which was this short stuff, uh, short uh, cut, and I just got completely lost. And after a while, I said to Kimberly, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. I, I, we, we, we are lost. We eventually found our way. I, I didn't want to stop from ask for directions, but we eventually figured it out. And we pull up to Precious Moments at 7.05 p.m., and they had closed at 7 p.m. And here's my little seven-year-old daughter, Leah, crying because Precious Moments was closed. And I did not get the Father of the Year award that particular year. Not any year, by the way, but that particular year wasn't wasn't even close. And I just felt terrible because I had taken a shortcut. I had actually made things worse. A shortcut will take us longer to get where God actually wants us to be. And I know there's things you want in your life, things I want in my life, but we've got to wait and do it God's way, not take things into our own hands and do it our way. We've got to wait for God's timing and not rush ahead with our timing. And David was just a man after God's own heart who was willing to do it God's way and wait for God's timetable. And then number three, David had a heart that was humble before God. Uh, The prophet Nathan, in this passage we're going to look at, has just told him that his throne is going to be established forever, and that eventually, through Christ, billions of people are going to be in God's kingdom, including us here today who are following Jesus. So Nathan, the prophet, tells him the staggering uh, information about how God was going to bless and use him. And in 2 Samuel 7, verse 18, then King David went in and just sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? Who, who, who are we that you should do this thing through us? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you've also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. I like that. Let's go back to that for just a second. It's for a mere human. Well, actually, it was through Christ 
these promises to David were actually going to come through his line, and Christ was in his line, and so it was not a mere human that was going to accomplish these things. It, it was God come in human form, Christ, who was eventually going to accomplish the promises that had just been gave, given to David. But David was going to be a vehicle for these things to happen, and he's overwhelmed by that. Now going on to verse 20, what more can David say to you, for you know your servant, sovereign Lord? For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. Now let's compare that humble attitude uh, to Saul in 1 Samuel 15, verse, verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle. They were told not to do this, but they did it anyway. The fat calves and lambs, everything that was good, these they were unwilling to destroy, to destroy completely, unwilling to give up to God the good stuff, but instead they gave God the leftovers. And we're so tempted to do that, not to give God the first tithe of our income, but to give him, if there's anything happens to be left at the end of the month, to give him the scraps off the table, to give him the leftovers. Uh, these, the, the best they were unwilling to destroy completely, to devote over to God, but everything that was despised and weak, that they totally destroyed and gave over to the Lord as an offering. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I've made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all of that night. And then uh, moving down to verse 22, but Samuel replied to Saul, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Your obe What God is looking for, for a man or a woman after God's own heart is obedience to his voice, to hearing his voice and obeying his voice. That's what it means to be a woman after God's own heart. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Your obedience to his voice Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. When we disobey God, it's in the category of witchcraft, the occult of following after the ways of Satan, when we're stubborn against God's will in our lives, it's as bad as if we were bowing down and worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Um, uh, his, his arrogance uh, had caused him to lose his position that God wanted to use him in. And God now turns to David, a man after his own heart, who was humble before God. Peter writes, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And then number four, David was willing and open to receiving godly rebuke. Uh, David even writes in Psalm 141, verse 5, Let a righteous man strike me. This is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. How do we respond when, when a friend or a family member or a, a fellow follower of Christ, when they lovingly confront us with something in our lives that's going to get us in trouble? How, how do we respond? Uh, after the prophet, prophet Nathan confronted David about his sin with Bathsheba, his immediate response was, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't blame his circumstances, didn't blame other people. He didn't try to trust the truth. He tried, didn't try to put on a front. He just said, I have sinned against the Lord, period. No buts after it. Now, there's an interesting backstory to be found in the genealogies of 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. If you're anything like me, 
you just skim through the the genealogies in the Bible. They're, they're, they're a chance to catch up on your Bible reading program. I love to see the genealogies because I'm like, okay, this is my catch-up day. I can fly right through these. But there are some nuggets in there if you linger on them uh, for a moment. And we see this in, in this David story. 2 Samuel 5, verse 14. These are the names of the children born to David there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. You're like, oh, that's interesting. Nathan was such a good friend that that David names one of his sons after Nathan. Isn't that cool? And, and that's the same Nathan, we believe, that confronted him with his sin with regard to the sin with Bathsheba that we're going to study in, in a couple of weeks here. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Oh, it gets better. It gets better. Now going to the genealogies of 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5. And these were the children born to David there, Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. So Chronicles basically says the same thing that 2 Samuel says. These four sons were by Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. You know what that means? The Nathan that was named by David after the prophet Nathan was after he had been rebuked by Nathan. David names a child after someone who gave him a godly rebuke. What a man after God's own heart. I admit to you that when when somebody confronts me on something, I'm glad, you know, in my mind, I'm glad, but I'm wounded by that. (laughs) And, And I don't have warm fuzzies. I don't feel like naming one of my kids after them, all right? I'm glad they did it. I think of some people in my life that, that kind of hurt my feelings even and confronted me when I needed to be confronted. But I don't have the kind of warm feelings. Let's let's name one of my children after him. David names his child, his son, after the man that confronted him with his sins. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we saw Abigail confront David when he was on his way to killing a bunch of innocent people. Here was David's response. David said to Abigail, "'Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel,' who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. David later marries Abigail, who gave him this godly rebuke. Uh, One of Pastor Eric's uh, favorite quotes, and he says it to us on the staff all the time, by Ken Blanchard, feedback, is the breakfast of champions. Um, Godly rebuke, confrontation, is the breakfast of spiritual champions. Now let's compare this to Saul, when his son Jonathan confronts him for trying to kill David. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I actually like saying that because it feels like you're cussing in church but it's like in the Bible, so it's totally okay. But anyway, you you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you've sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Um, Verse 32, why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. So here's the question. How do you treat those who confront you with something in your life that needs confrontation? Do you curse them and throw a spear at them like Saul? Or do you name your child after them and marry them like David? Do you hurl a spear and curses? Or do you marry him and name your child after him? That's the difference between Saul and David, the man after God's own heart. And then number five, David was unashamed to be a fool for God. They have a processional to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. 
And David dances in worship in front of all the people. And it says, when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, okay, like father, like, da- like, like daughter, okay, like father, like son, like father, like daughter, came out to meet him. She said in disgust how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. Do people ever think that you're a fool for following Jesus? People at school, people at work, in your family, uh, the Bible says that the real fool is the one who lives just for this life and not for eternity. Uh, Missionary Jim Elliott, who was killed for sharing the good news of Jesus, he wrote, he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And now here is the end result of the two ways that Saul and David lived their lives. Saul, not a man after God's own heart. David, a man after God's own heart. Samuel says to Saul, you have done a fool, foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, Your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. By the grace of God, may you and I, like David, be that woman after God's own heart or that man after God's own heart. And all God's family said, Amen.